All right, here we go. Salute to NBA Nation on this Friday afternoon. Another edition of the NBA Report. CP the Franchise, Alex Sotaros here on the ones and twos. Today's show, we are going to be reviewing the Boston Celtics offseason, man. Celtics with a busy offseason. Lots of comings and goings. And we are going to do that with the one, the only, Brian Scalabrini. He covers the Boston Celtics on uh, Celtics Network as well as uh, the starting lineup on NBA Radio with co-host Frank Isola. Uh, Brian, happy Friday, man. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Absolutely, man. Well, listen, man, we, we got to start this one off with Jalen Brown setting off the NBA uh, shockwaves through the NBA, man, with a five-year, $304 million Supermax contract. Uh, what was your reaction when when, uh, when you heard that the deal was finalized? I mean, I knew the deal was going to happen from day one. And once you, you know, like you have to make a, a decision in the NBA. You're Are you going to go with one superstar player and – you know, a bunch of 15 to $25 million a year players, or are you going to go with the two super max guys or two mega max guys where, and the rest of your players are going to be role players from all the dealings, this, you know, kind of after the season and everything that was going to, that was happening with the Marcus smart being traded for Zingas coming in. I felt like they were just going to make a move to say like Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum are the guys that we want to build around and from there, we're going to put the ball in their hands. And if they take us to where we need to go, we're going to find out if, if, if they're on that level. And, and so far, Jalen and Jason never had to be on that level. They've had, in the past, Kyrie Irving. They've had Kemba Walker. Then they sort of got the reins passed to them. And then they had a really successful year last year. Then they bring in Malcolm Brogdon. So it's like it's a very, very different – league for them right now it's basically they're going to have to lead this team they're going to have to work together they're going to have to make sure that they can take their games and be more than just scorers they got to average close to 13 14 assists if they're going to really make this thing happen you know, Scott, when I look at the reactions from Celtics fans and non-Celtics fans alike, you have, he's overpaid. They overpaid him by 40%. Uh, a lot of recency bias. Obviously, the meltdown in Game 7 against Miami, the eight turnovers, so on and so forth. But uh, the way I look at it as you have two players in their prime in, in Tatum and Brown, 25 and 26 respectively, took this team to the finals two years ago, Eastern Conference Finals a number of times. I mean, yes, the guy has his shortcomings, but... What other options does Boston have to maintain a contender window? I mean, these two guys, to me, they're, they're fourth in NBA history in terms of scoring duo at, at a, I believe, like 56.7. I mean, where else are they going to go to maintain that window? To me, this is a guy who still has some more growing to do despite his shortcomings. You got to invest in it. This is the cost of doing business. Yeah, and also, I think that... Um... What people have to understand is like there's the NBA regular season and then the playoffs. Like let's look at a guy like Jimmy Butler. Look to the level that he rose to in the playoffs. And you know I think that Jimmy Butler was always the guy in Miami when they looked at him. They looked at him for big games. They looked at him down the stretch. The Celtics are like the the difference between what they've done in the past and what I feel like they're going to do this year is both these guys are going to be required night in and night out to 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 win games, not just score thirty not do it against bad teams, not do it in the first three quarters. It's like doing it time and time again. And I'll tell you, as much as they would score, you would be, you know, I have to do every single game. I have to analyze every game. You, you'd be really surprised on the amount of times in the fourth quarter where it's just those two guys winning you a ball game. It's a lot of times it's Derek White, Marcus Smart, Malcolm Brogdon, Tatum one night, then it's Brown. It's like it's really interesting – that after all these years of success, they never really had to get the screws put to them where if you lose a game, it falls on you two. And if you win this game, it's going to be because of you two. That has, has, I'm not saying, listen, there's 82 of these bad boys. These guys have been together for a long time. But that's not happening as much as people think that it's happening. And it's going to happen a ton moving forward because when you get paid the big bucks, this is what you are required to do. You are required to to win games in the fourth quarter, you are required to win games when your counterpart is out. And I think that as much as you can look at all their numbers and say, well, this guy's done this and this guy's done that, 
I think they'll both be put to the test this year with what they're doing. And I think that it's a learning process. I've been a part of young players that had to grow into that role. And I know that they're not young, but it's a learning process to learn how to do that night in and night out, which in, in my opinion will help them in the playoffs. You know, one of the things I'm fascinating to see, because as you said, it, it, the spotlight is on them right now. Uh, but Jalen Brown has had a, a quite a tumultuous relationship with the Boston fans. You go all the way back to draft night. They booed the pick. Even last year, they booed him for his his ineffectiveness and inconsistency. He came out. He, he calls some of the Boston fans toxic. But now the bullseye's on his back. He's the highest paid player on the team for now until Tatum gets his bag. How do you feel like he's going to handle that pressure of having to perform every night in front of these fans? I'm not, I'm not sure that there's more pressure than before. I'm, I know it, it sounds like there is, but I think some of that stuff can, uh, when you talk about pressure in the NBA, sometimes it's a no-win situation. I don't feel like Jalen Brown's in a no-win situation. I feel like if he goes out there and just does his job, which is, you know, go out there and hoop. Now, like, I don't think he'll ever have a problem putting up numbers. I don't think he'll have a problem guarding, rebounding. I don't think he'll have a problem with any of those things. The question will remain, like, the pressure on Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum is, can you make people around you better? That's going to be the challenge for those two guys. And I'm not even sure that fans or media people will even identify that as the biggest challenge moving forward for them. I think there are going to be times when those guys can score 30. Both those guys can score 30 on any given night. So when when you say pressure, I think the pressure to win a championship probably comes down to can they improve the players around them. I don't think it's going to be outside pressure because talent-wise, these guys can score at a high level. And the tumultuous relationship with the fans, I mean, that's, that's all like uh, – one person's opinion versus another. I know he said stuff before in the past about not being able to buy a house or Boston has a lot of work to do or, you know, like there's a lot of things that, that, that can come into play there. But I, I think he, the team uh, rewarded him with the biggest contract in NBA history. In the NBA, people use this word respect. Respect usually ties into money, and, and the Celtics can't show him any more respect than they already have. <laughs> True, indeed. That's a, that's a fact. That's a fact with – him getting the largest contract in NBA history at $304 million. Scott, I got a question, though. Do you think part of the overpay, because I kind of do see it as an overpay just on, you know, the entire, like, work of art that we see from all these other players who are highly paid in the NBA. I mean, you look at Carl Anthony Towns, Devin Booker, Bradley Beal. You got Nico Jokic up there now with Jalen Brown being number one. Only one of those guys have won a championship. Do you think that Brown making this much money is due to him being involved in so many trade rumors? No, I think it has to do with the collective bargaining agreement, and he happened to be voted first, you know, first, second, or third team All NBA, and he was going to get the max amount of money, regardless if it, that is the super max at three o four, or if he didn't make All NBA, and the Celtics could have extended him for, I think the amount was uh, forty or one sixty. So either way, he was going to get max money because the Celtics were going to show him that they value him and and him he happened to be all an all nba player so therefore the Celtics are going to give him the max and that max happened to be 304 that's that's nothing it's weird about the nba and value you can't like i'm sure like you mentioned nicole Jokic is probably underpaid Giannis probably underpaid there are some guys that you would just look at it like they're limited by the collective bargaining agreement and some guys benefit from that and jalen brown this particular season being an all nba player when he could get uh, all NBA extension eligible, he got and and he's going to get the max, and that's just the way the NBA has worked in the past, and will always work this way. So then, with this contract now and, and him being one of the main focal points, obviously you got Jason Tatum. What do you want to see from Jalen Brown as in terms of improvements? Now that he's going to be one of the lead dogs. Well, I, I've always said this about these two guys, and I've been saying this for about three years now, and everyone thought I was nuts because. They can't see like the evolution of the game, but if if the Celtics are going to win a championship, Tatum and Brown have to average somewhere between like 13 and 15 assists a night. So that could be anywhere between like seven and a half a piece. That could be eight and six, you know. But uh, I know that those guys can score, but the 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 value of being like that big time of a player making that amount of money is can you make people around you better, including can Brown make Tatum better and can Tatum make Brown better. The stats on those two getting assist to each other are 
poultry right now. They have to improve that area. I always thought when I watched uh, LeBron and D. Wade, early LeBron and D. Wade, it felt like they were two individuals playing together. But when they were really rolling, like after year one, man, those guys played off each other so well. So ideally, you'll see more of that from Tatum and Brown. And But also, you know, like uh, Jalen Brown has had a 10 assist, 11 assist night. Like he needs to be closer to that number than he is to the two or three nights. Well, once again, we're talking to Brian Scalabrini, who covers the Boston Celtics for NBC Boston, also the co-host of the starting lineup with Frank Isola on Sirius XM Channel 86. You know, Scal, you, you hit the nail on the head in, in terms of, of Tatum and Brown having to be more consistent playmakers because, yes, in the regular season, Boston will be, they'll be top 10 in assists, they're top 10 efficient, and they'll get out there, they'll, they'll spray and, and kick out for their the three-point shot. But sometimes they, they get buried and stuck in the mud. It becomes my turn, your turn turn and I look at it and I'm just wondering is it is it more on Missoula is it personnel like do they need a a, a more play facilitator a playmaker at the point guard position I think Porzingis will help but what, what do you think you know is, is the key adjustment there is it more coaching or personnel just possessions like I don't think that um I think with smart gone I think so smart probably led let's say uh I'd probably say anywhere between 20 and 25 possessions where he's kind of like running the show. Well, those don't get divvy, uh, divvied out like right down the middle. Like Derek White will get some of those. But Malcolm Brogdon, I, I'd be hard-pressed to say that he's going to get any more possessions. When he's on the floor, he's pretty much 50% of the possessions that the Celtics have are dictated from Brogdon. He just doesn't play that many minutes. Like he only plays between 20 and 23 minutes. So I just think with more possessions – that they'll have, they'll be able to make more plays. Like it's a funny thing about the NBA. Like if you give a bona fide star averaging close to 30 points a game, you give them eight to 10 more possessions. They don't take eight to 10 more shots. They usually take about one, maybe two more shots, but they just make, they're just so much more willing to pass as opposed to saying, man, I haven't touched this thing in a while. This is my only opportunity to score. I got to go and make something happen. So I think you'll see like a high volume I would probably go out on a limb right now. Maybe it's not even a limb. You won't find a duo in the NBA that has more a more usage rate when you combine them together. So that's what you'll see moving forward. And I think with more possessions, there's just more plays to be made. Mm. Now, Scal, you know, the Celtics were went out and got Christos Porzingis in that in that trade where they shipped out Marcus Smart. What are you expecting from Christoph Porzingis to bring to the Boston Celtics? And it seems like they want to, you know, they see Christoph as a big portion of what the Celtics are going to be doing next because he did give him that two-year extension worth about $60 million. Yeah, no question. I mean, um, like the, the Celtics' weakness would per se would be size. You know, like they just, they want to, they want to play skilled, but they want to play with length. So, you know, I don't know what Al Horford's going to do this year. Like, I know he's making significantly less at his age. He's 37 going on 38. So I, I doubt that he's going to play, you know, close to 35 minutes a night. So with that, and then you have the, in, the injury history of Robert Williams. So like Chris Porzingis is a bona fide big that could stretch the floor and he could, he can, uh, so he can allow you to play both ways. Like he also very, uh, very high in his numbers in the drop coverage and pick and roll, very high in his numbers of post defense one-on-one -on -one against other post players, very high in his post per uh, points per possession and scoring. So those are all things the Celtics needed to improve on. And like he's not just a pick and pop player to me, but he can also improve that area. And if uh, it gives Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, another bona fide target, like if Porzingis is at his best, he's averaging 18 to 22 points a game. And if you add what Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum are going to do, like that makes that that uh, that trio very very difficult to stop. So I know we're going to miss Marcus Smart, but it's you know wings right now are more of an abundance in the NBA. Skilled bigs are really hard to find, so you exchange a wing for a skilled big. And I think it's a uh, it's, it's not it's not Chris Stapp coming in to replace Marcus. You know you have different guys to take that that role like. Brown, Tatum, and Derek White will all take a little bit of the role that Marcus Smart did. Those guys would be required to guard. Like in the playoffs, Jalen Brown was our best defender. He was the one on James Harden after James Harden had the 41. So mm -hmm. in general, I just feel like uh, 
having more offensive balance, more positional balance is going to be a good thing for the team. So that's that's what I expect Porzingis to do. But it, it, he was in Washington last year. He was he had as good of a year as any any big in the NBA minus Jokic and Embiid. So it's it just it went under the radar because he was in Washington and no one was watching Washington play as they lose and get back into the lottery again. And now I just got one follow-up yeah. question. Um, do you see anything changing with Robert Williams now with KP acquisition? No, I mean, I think for Robert Williams, just about staying healthy. I do see like if one thing Al Horford's at the point now where he probably, you know, this is me just speculating that he probably doesn't care as much game to game about his numbers. Like he's just signed a two year, $20 million deal, it's like 10 million a year. I think he's now is like, okay, how can I navigate the season? How can I get to the point where the playoffs are here? So we'll see a lot of lineups. Where you'll see Rob Williams out there and Chris that Porzingis together. But, you know, remember, Rob Williams has been on minute restriction all last year. And it's like he was not the same player he was the year before. So I, I'm not saying he can't get to that. But, you, you know, when you're building a team and you have a, a you have championship aspirations, you have to have an idea that – if Rob was unable to play, if Rob was going to miss time, you have to have another plan. Your plan can't be just, well, let's just hope for the playoffs to come around. Like it has to be more than that. So I think that's what Porzingis provides. And, and Scott, when you, you talk about Marcus Smart, Jalen Brown spoke highly of him in his press conference yesterday with the Celtics, uh, just, just speaking about how much he learned from him and, and uh, just kind of being the heart and soul of that team. Do you see uh, – what did you see as the impact of Smart – um, especially defensively and in that locker room, and, and how much will he be missed with the Celtics uh, team? Yeah, no question he'll be missed. Um, but that's it's just it's more of a financial question, and I, I try to explain this to people, and sometimes people can't pick this up, but when you get paid the money that Brown and Tatum are going to make, then you're, you're replacing. You, now, you, you, need, you need to be the heart and soul of the team. You need to be the one that, that is the leader of the team. Like that, you see what I mean by that? Like, it's all good when everyone's making rookie scales or a low level extension or whatever. But as soon as you get a guy that makes fifty million dollars, you are now required to do more than just score twenty seven points a game. You know, you have to be the heart and soul of the team. If you look around at all the great teams or the great players, and ideally the ones making the big bucks and winning championships, they're the ones that are the leaders of the team. So that's what I I think. Hopefully Jalen Brown has picked that stuff up from Marcus Smart, but that's where I think when when you ask me where Smart will be missed the most, um, I would say, you know, like those defensive plays, instinctual defensive plays that he makes in the fourth quarter. But once again, if you make fifty million, you know, that's when you start doing that, you need to start making those defensive plays. You need to start being the defensive stopper of the team. You need to start being the leader. And I think Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum are ready for that. Scal, what do you need to see from Joe Missoula this season? Because last season, it just seemed at times he was in over his head. I mean, we had a lot of people say, you know, this guy doesn't seem to know when to call timeouts. And from the previous two coaches that you had, Brad Stevens, who's now in the front office, leading this Celtics from the front office. And then you went from to Ime Adoka, who really was that key spark to have that turnaround season two seasons ago. What do you need to see from Missoula going into this season? I mean, I think, uh, like, first of all, Joe's a really bright guy. Like, he's really smart. And, you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't love the way that we played at times with the three-point shooting, and, and they would convince me that that's a, the best way to play is not to pass up open threes. And, you know, I, I, I'm not saying they're going to run it back this year. You know, it's like it's kind of tough to get thrusted into that situation where – you know, and you, and you guys just said it, like, Ime was so respected. And then whatever happened, the players kind of got blindsided by the whole idea that he was not going to be the coach. And then Joe Mazzula gets picked on and he can't pick up and he can't pick his staff and everything like that. So I think my expectations are for him with all of his, like, basketball knowledge to finally get his feet underneath him, to have a time to prepare, to, to build relationships with guys. Like, all that stuff is really hard to do on the fly. And – that's, you know, like if you ask any NBA coach, you know, staff is important. Uh, building relationships, of, you know, with players at the head coach is important. You know, where are you going to put your energy and effort? What are you going to emphasize? Like all that stuff is important. So 
I have a feeling that um, he'll he'll just have a better year. And even like I talked to Brad Stevens about this. Brad Stevens' first year, he won like 27 games, and he was like, mm-hmm. "Man, I was like drowning in the NBA because of how fast it was, and you know, and the possessions that I and not not talent or anything like that, just." just the game and how, how quick the game is and how rapid fire the games come at you. So, you know, I, I coached one year with the Golden State Warriors and I, I didn't, I never got my feet underneath me. Like the games just came at me at a, such a rapid pace. It's just like anything you do in life, you improve and you get better. And I think Joe, I think Joe Mazzulla will find his, find his footing, find his voice, find out what he wants to emphasize and find out what to worry about and not worry about. I don't think it's timeouts. I'll tell you that. Like a lot of people, don't fully understand timeouts and how at times he doesn't use them and it works out, but no one ever says anything. So like, I would, I would steer clear of like listening to fans about when to call timeouts and stuff like that. Like that's, that's fine, but I don't think they really understand the ins and outs of when a timeout is yours versus somebody else's. I don't think they really, depending on if you're home or if you're on the road, those are all things that Joe Mazzula has a good idea about, but it just an idea of getting his footing underneath them. Once again, we're talking to Brian Scalabrini, who covers the Boston Celtics for NBC Sports Boston, also the co-host of the starting lineup on Sirius XM Channel 86, NBA Radio with Frank Isola from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, final question for you, Scal, not Celtics related, uh, but Big Three related, because Ice Cube has been on, on his Big Three media tour uh, uh, the, as of late, and, and you've been a part of the Big Three. But, you know, Cube has come out and said, you know, he's not happy with the lack of support from the NBA and the media at large. He, he feels excluded from it. Uh, what's your take on, on his stance there? And, and how do you feel like, you know, the NBA should, should the NBA get involved and kind of support the big three, considering that most of the players are comprised of, of former NBA players? I definitely think that the union should get involved and try to help. I definitely think that like the NBA, I know what they're, they have to balance a lot of things like the WNBA as well as FIBA and their own summer league and all that. So I understand it from their perspective, but I'm, I, I'm, I was always really surprised that the NBA players association hasn't got more involved in, uh, you know, like collaborations with the big three and getting, you know, because it, he, they are they're the MB, the, the big three is allowing former NBA players to continue to play and make money. And I'm, and I'm not saying like the union, like I, I, they don't need to start representing, you know, in, uh, the big three and being a union for the big three. But I was, I was just surprised. There's, there's so many great union programs out there, I, and there's like these programs where you can go back to college and and do all these things, and they can place you in a job and here and there. This one is like a real thing. Like it can really help a lot of guys. I'm not saying, and maybe guys shouldn't be struggling, or maybe they are, maybe they're not. I don't, I, you know, like, but I, I was. I'm really surprised that the union hasn't sort of stepped up and and um, and helped out and got involved and 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 gone down that road. But you know, like Ice Cube's doing an amazing job of building this league and getting like the interest to to go where it needs to go, and people are watching on CBS Sports. But um, yeah, I mean, I would I would say that the uh, it would be nice if the union could I don't know support a little bit through social media or you know, have some collaborative efforts about how to make it a better, you know, ex- experience for former players and, you know, things like that. Yeah, well, well said, man. And hopefully all sides involved can uh, can come together and, and uh, bring the bring the big three into into the fold, man. But, Brian, definitely appreciate the time, man. I, I know you just got back from vacation, so definitely appreciate it and enjoy the rest of the summer, and hopefully we can do this again next time. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Thanks again.